Hi class, it's Dr. Lindner. Let's take a look at the different organelles. Now that we've spent lots of time talking about the cell membrane and we've spoke quite a bit about diffusion and how things get in and out of the cell, um, let's talk a little bit about some of the other organelles and how they work synergistically to create a uh, mm -hmm. function. So the plasma membrane we spoke about quite a bit before. It's the outer boundary of the cell. It protects the cell. It controls the movement of things in and out of the cell. We spoke quite a bit about the phospholipid bilayer and the functions of proteins within the cell wall and um, channels and carrier proteins and concentration gradient and diffusion and osmosis. So lots of things under that, that category. By now we should know the extracellular fluid is what's outside of the cell and the cytosol is the fluid that's inside of the cell, also known as intracellular fluid. So these are kind of like opposites, right? Cytosol and extracellular fluid are opposites. The cytoplasm is consists of the cytosol and all the contents of the cell but everything that's outside of the nucleus, that's the cytoplasm. Microvilli and cilia, the microvilli increase the surface area of the cell and it allows for greater absorption. This is gonna come in quite handy when we get into AMP2 and we talk about digestion. Um, if this is, an intestinal cell, and let's say that's an intestinal cell, they have these cilia, I'm sorry, they have these microvilli on the top. And inside of the cell, you may have arteries, and you're going to have, let me just move this out of the way here, and we will have, uh, veins, you have arteries and veins, and we'll even have um, lymphatics in here. And what ends up happening is they'll connect To the main blood vessels. So we'll have food, like food particles that's traveling through the lumen of the intestine, and these are broken down by digestive enzymes into smaller and smaller bits, and they get absorbed by the microvilli and get pulled in to the cell, and they get pulled in into the venous system. Okay. So if these microvilli degenerate or break down, like people who are sensitive to gluten or have celiac disease, that certainly can affect the absorption of their nutrients and their overall health and well-being. So microvilli are um, extremely important. Cilia, on the other hand, let's say, Let's say this is a woman's um, uterus. I know it's not the best picture, but it is what it is. And then these are the fallopian tubes or the uterine tubes. And then let's say here's an ovary and here's an ovary. So here's the vaginal canal. Here's the cervix. Here's the uterus. And here are the ovaries. The ovary has an egg. And at around day 14 of a woman's menstrual cycle, ovulation takes place. And the egg is sucked up into the fallopian tubes. And what we have are the cilia. We have the cilia, these hair-like projections that are in the fallopian tubes. And what they're doing is they're beating rhythmically in this direction. 
And the reason why they're beating in this direction is to try and propel the egg in this direction. Whereas sperm are moving in this direction. So the sperm have a lot of work to do. They're trying to go in here and they're trying to have a little party here and meet up with the egg. And when the egg and sperm come together, then you have fertilization. When you have the fertilized egg, you've got the beating of that fertilized egg by the cilia and it's moving here into the uterus where hopefully implantation takes place. So the cilia are designed to move material or even debris. You have it in the fallopian tubes. We have it in our respiratory tract as well. So if this is the respiratory tract, let's say this is the trachea and we have cilia lining all of the respiratory tract and you're breathing in air that's smoky and it's got dust and it's got foreign particles, what the body has is stuck between these columnar cells, we have these goblet cells. And goblet cells produce mucus. And the mucus moves from the goblet cells and it sticks to the top of the cilia. Okay? When it sticks to the top of the cilia, it allows for all the dust and debris to stick to that mucus membrane but all of the cilia are beating in an upward direction, preventing all the debris and foreign particles from making it deeper into the lungs. So the cilia is really important. What happens with smoking, what happens with smoking is that it paralyzes the cilia. And when it paralyzes and kills the cilia, uh, you have a problem because now you're getting all the chemicals and debris deeper into the lungs. And what lines the trachea are these type of cells, right? These are columnar cells. Those are columnar cells and they have cilia. And when you kill them, the body makes a, a shift from columnar cells and all of a sudden they become these irregular shaped cells called squamous cells. And that's what squamous cell carcinoma is. Whenever you change from one cell type into another, the term for that is called metaplasia. Metaplasia is when you go from one cell type into another, and that's always precancerous. Whenever you go from one cell type to another that doesn't belong there, it's metaplasia and it's precancerous. Who knows this better than anyone? Women, because when women go for a pap smear, and they slough off cells from here, from the tip of the cervix, and it goes to the histologist, they'll say, oh, the cell shapes are different. They're changing in size and structure. You have cervical dysplasia, which is a form of metaplasia. They just call it cervical dysplasia. All right, so microvilli and cilia are very, uh, very important. Um, let's look at some of these other terms. Organelles, these are all the specialized structures within the cell. They all have different uh, shapes or different structures, which means they all have different functions, but they're all designed to maintain function. They're involved in cell growth and even reproduction. The process of cellular reproduction is called mitosis. That's how cells multiply and divide. And I'm sure you learned about them in lab where it was PMAT, where you had prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And what was involved with that are the uh, centrosomes, which is linked to the centrioles. The centrosome is that dense body near the nucleus and it contains pairs of centrioles. Centrioles are the paired organelles 
that are made up of protein. And because it's a thicker protein, they're called microtubules. The smaller proteins are called microfilaments. And if they're between the thinnest ones and the thickest ones, then we call them intermediate filaments. Cytoskeleton, well, cyto, site is cell and skeleton. So it's just a bunch of proteins, protein elements like microtubules that are scattered throughout the cytoplasm. And they really provide structural support. Microtubules are found in other parts of the body, not just you know, when we're talking about a cell, but when we go over muscle in another uh, chapter in other videos, muscle is made up of actin and myosin. And these are two different types of proteins and micro, the myosin are the microtubules. They are a thicker type of protein. Actin is very thin. Actin is thin, the myosin is thicker, microtubules. So when we look at them here, the cytoskeleton, you'll see they come in three flavors, right? They're microfilaments, which are the thinnest, intermediate, that's a little bit thicker, and then microtubules, that's the thickest. So the microtubules, that's found in muscle, that would be myosin, but it's also involved with the centrosome making up those spindles. Okay, ribosomes, these are complexes of RNA and protein. They're found in all cells. And the function of ribosomes is for the synthesis of proteins. They're involved in protein synthesis. And there's two types. There are fixed ribosomes and then free ribosomes. When you see ribosomes that are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum, then we refer to that as the rough ER. Rough, because what gives it the rough appearance are the ribosomes attached to it. So it gives it a very, very grainy look. What the fixed ribosomes are doing is that they are making proteins, but they're designed to secrete them out of the cell or to be incorporated by the cell membrane. Because remember, the cell membrane is 50-50. It's 50% protein, 50% fat, and the proteins can get damaged. The proteins can get damaged by oxidative stress that's happening to your cells and your body. So your body always wants to recycle that cell membrane and the rough ER is responsible for producing protein to help recycle it. The proteins enter the endoplasmic reticulum where they're modified and they're packaged for secretion. Okay. The free ribosomes, these are ribosomes that are not attached to anything. They're just roaming in the cytoplasm. And it's responsible for making proteins for the cell not for exporting out of the cell, but designed for the cell itself. The nucleus, this is the control center of the cell and it's the location for all your genes. And it contains your deoxyribose nucleic acid, the DNA. This is the instruction template. This has all your codes, okay? The nucleolus, which is deep to the nucleus, that's the site of ribosomal RNA synthesis, and that's deep inside the nucleus. The endoplasmic reticulum, the ER, that's the membrane network within the cytoplasm, and it's involved in the synthesis, the modification, and transport of materials within the cell. It's like a, a circulatory system within the cell, right? This would be equivalent to like our blood vessels in the microscopic level. We have a rough ER and we have a smooth ER. The rough ER is continuous with the nuclear envelope. It's got the fixed or attached ribosomes to it and it's involved in the synthesis of proteins, glycoproteins and 
phospholipids. So this is really important. Phospholipids are needed for the cell membrane and glycoproteins are needed for the cell membrane and proteins we know when we covered the cell membrane, how important they are. Channels, enzymes, receptors, carrier molecules, cell identity markers, the, the major histocompatibility complex, very, very important. Smooth ER is called smooth. It looks smooth because there's no ribosomes that are attached to the membrane. It's continuous with the rough ER. There's just no um, ribosomes attached because their structure looks different, they function different, these don't synthesize proteins. Well, if they don't synthesize proteins, then what are they doing? They're involved in carbohydrate metabolism and the synthesis and modification of lipids. So it's not involved with protein metabolism at all. So here's the ER, right? Here's the nucleus, we can see the nuclear envelope. We could see ribosomes that are attached here. When they're attached to this endoplasmic reticulum, we call it the rough ER. We could see that the smooth ER is continuous with the rough ER. It just doesn't have any fixed ribosomes attached to it. So this one's for the carbohydrate metabolism and the uh, synthesis of uh, lipids and metabolism of fats and lipids. This is responsible for making proteins that will be exported out of the cell or used for the cell membrane. Now the Golgi complex or Golgi apparatus that consists of a bunch of flattened saccules. And I think like on the model that kind of look like a stack of pancakes like that. And they're involved in sorting and modifying proteins. And I'll show you what they do. So like the, 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 the rough ER can make proteins and then it can ship it to the Golgi apparatus. And this is like the UPS center. This is the shipping center. So it's gonna put them in boxes, right? It can repackage them and then ship them out. And maybe, maybe this one is going to go to recycle the cell membrane. Maybe this one's gonna go out outside of the cell for exocytosis. And maybe this one coming out is a lysosome that has lots of hydrogen in it that's designed to um, break down debris. So the Golgi complex is just repackaging and um, giving the destiny of that protein as to where it's going to go. Lysosomes, that's, uh, I said, for example, if that was a lysosome, it contains digestive enzymes. They tend to have lots of hydrogen in it. So the more hydrogen that's in a cell, the more hydrogens equate to more acidity. So if there's a bacteria or a debris or a pathogen, that vesicle that's produced that has lots of digestive enzymes and hydrogen in it, which acts as a digestive enzyme, it gets rid of all that uh, cellular debris. Peroxisomes, these two, they're similar to lysosomes. These are uh, enzyme-filled um, vesicles but here they're detoxifying harmful substances. They're neutralizing dangerous free radicals. So peroxisomes are found in the liver and in the kidneys where those organs are involved in detoxifying the body. Peroxisomes are also involved in breaking down fats, breaking down fatty acids. When we break down fatty acids, we call that beta oxidation. Remember, fats are a long carbon chain, right? Because it's an organic molecule. And when we break things down, fats are broken down by every two carbons. So when you break things down at every two carbons, that's alpha, that's beta. The second carbon is always beta. 
So beta oxidation is how we break down fats. And the mitochondria, this is the site of aerobic energy production or ATP. We know ATP is adenosine triphosphate. This is a picture that just shows that this looks like it's part of the um, endoplasmic reticulum or the rough ER, and it's synthesized the protein. We can see that this is a protein vesicle and it's transporting it into this Golgi complex. And as it goes in here, the body can do lots of things with it. It can modify it. Maybe it's gonna be a transfer vesicle. Maybe it's moving out to secrete, right? It's whatever this protein is, it's exporting it out of the cell. That method is called exocytosis. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a neurotransmitter. Maybe it's a digestive enzyme that it's pushing out. Maybe it's gonna repackage it and use the proteins to recycle the cell membrane. So maybe this is gonna move in this direction and it opens up and the proteins here are used to recycle the proteins within the cell membrane. It's a membrane vesicle, it's pretty cool. Or it creates a lysosome, right? Lots of hydrogens inside to clear out cellular debris. In terms of lysosomes, since I just mentioned lysosomes, lysosomes, there, are, there can be uh, genetic diseases or genetic disorders that affect lysosomal and the lysosomal enzymes. One in particular is called Tay-Sachs, which affects children of Eastern European Ashkenazi descent. And when people have Tay-Sachs, some of the symptoms are seizures, muscle rigidity, they could be blind, demented and sadly die before the age of five. And it's a genetic disorder that's caused by the absence of a lysosomal enzyme. And the lysosomal enzyme that we all have, it's supposed to break down glycolipids that are commonly found on nerve cells. But if you don't have that lysosomal enzyme, then the glycolipids don't break down, they actually accumulate. And when they accumulate, the nerve cell is going to lose its ability to function. And now, you know, with a lot of advanced technology, there's chromosomal testing that can determine a couple's uh, chances of creating a child that has Tay-Sachs disorder. So it's very important if you're planning on having a child, both parents should get their DNA checked so that you're prepared. You're prepared that, hey, what are the chances of this happening? Now, in terms of mitochondria, mitochondria is a, a very fascinating um, organelle. It resembles bacteria. And within the mitochondria, there's a matrix and there are cristae. And inside this matrix, this is where the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain take place. It's a double membrane organelle. The central cavity is the matrix and the folding of the membrane is referred to as Christe. And that's the actual region in where the Krebs cycle takes place, which is cellular respiration. And the purpose of that, I know it's called the powerhouse of the cell, but it's that because it's generating adenosine triphosphate. What's interesting about mitochondria is that they have their own DNA. They can self-replicate. Most of the mitochondria, if not all of the mitochondria that we get, we get from our mother on the maternal side. We get it from ma. The more mitochondria, the more ATP you can generate. The more you exercise, the more muscle mass you develop, the more mitochondria you develop, that's called mitochondrial biogenesis because you're generating new mitochondria, mitochondrial biogenesis, biogenesis to produce more. If you're not doing anything and you're being uh, more stagnant, the number of mitochondria decrease 
and you get lazier. It's like, oh, I have no energy. Well, no kidding. You have no energy because you're not doing anything. Then when you start doing stuff and you become more active, your body sees the demand, it creates more mitochondria and you can produce more energy. That's pretty neat. The, in order to create energy, your body has to take that glucose, which is that six carbon sugar, and it's got to break it down. It's got to split it so that it becomes these two, three carbon sugars. That's called glycolysis. And that occurs in the cytosol or in the cytoplasm of the cell. The pyruvic acid, which is this, right? Glucose becomes pyruvic acid after glycolysis. If we have oxygen that's present, then the pyruvic acid can enter into the mitochondria for the Krebs cycle to take place. So within here, we have the Krebs cycle, and then we have the electron transport chain that help us produce energy. Now, in the beginning, were there plants or were there animals? Well, first, they were plants, and plants go through photosynthesis, and it creates oxygen for us to breathe. Bacteria, we know that bacteria has their own DNA. And it's simple, so it evolved quicker into aerobic bacteria. Cells became infected by bacteria and spread and divided. And the theory is that we took that bacteria, and when we took it to work in harmony with it, it's called an endosymbiotic relationship. So the theory is that the mitochondria was really bacteria that learned to live with us to create some serious function, which is to produce ATP. But it does resemble bacteria, which is why when we take antibiotics, we destroy mitochondria. When we destroy mitochondria, we decrease the amount of ATP we produce. In fact, where are most mitochondria found they're found in parts of the body that require the most energy. So the neural system and the muscles have the most mitochondria because they're always working. We always need ATP. If you research antibiotics, there's a certain type of antibiotic that destroys so much mitochondria that it damages tendons. And we all know people that will see them in a, uh, an ankle boot. And when they're in an ankle boot, you go, what happened? They go, I don't know. I don't know what I did. It was just walking and a tour. When you do a deeper analysis, many of those people were on antibiotics that destroyed the mitochondria and weakened the tendons. Why did it become weak? They didn't have enough energy, no ATP. So you always want to be careful if you ever need antibiotics because you're in a crisis situation, it doesn't create myopathies or you know destroy the tendons. So mitochondria have their own DNA. They can increase or decrease in number. So if we compare the couch potato to the athlete, the athlete has more mitochondria. The couch potato has less, but the athlete can become a couch potato and the couch potato can become the athlete. If you have lots of mitochondria and then you stop and do nothing, the number of mitochondria decrease. If you're a couch potato, become motivated and inspired, the number of mitochondria can increase in number and that's called mitochondrial biogenesis. So we want to be careful with overusing antibiotics. Anti is against, bio is life. This just shows the mitochondria. It shows that glucose gets broken down into pyruvate. That's called glycolysis. That takes place in the cytoplasm. So that pyruvate in the presence of oxygen can enter the mitochondria for the citric acid cycle, also known as the Krebs cycle. And the Krebs cycle requires lots of B vitamins, B1, B2, and B3. The citric acid cycle pushes off CO2, which is carbon dioxide. That's what we breathe in. And the oxygen, I'm sorry, the uh, CO2 is what we breathe out. The oxygen we breathe in, we're breathing it in so that the citric acid or Krebs cycle can produce some energy. And the exhaust of that is carbon dioxide that we exhale. 
the citric acid cycle is also producing coenzymes and those coenzymes are used by the electron transport chain. And it is the electron transport chain that really is responsible for producing the majority of the ATP. The citric or acid cycle or Krebs cycle makes some ATP, but very little, not a lot, nothing significant. It's the uh, electron transport chain that uses the coenzymes that are produced by this to produce the ATP. So it is a very important required step. And the electron transport chain requires iron and requires CoQ10 and requires magnesium. And that's why when people are iron deficient anemia, they have fatigue because the electron transport chain can't make enough ATP if you're deficient in iron. Why? Well, Think of a red blood cell. A red blood cell carries hemoglobin and hemoglobin, the heme is iron. It has an iron containing portion and oxygen binds to iron. If you don't have iron, how do you bind? How does, what is oxygen gonna bind to? And you need oxygen to bring it into the Krebs cycle to make the coenzymes that are needed by the electron transport chain. You see the vicious cycle here. So we need iron and we need CoQ10. And in a previous video, I talk about how statins, which are used for people that have high cholesterol, like Lipitor, Crestor, Simvastatin, Arvastatin, and that ends in statin is used to decrease cholesterol, also decreases CoQ10. If you don't have CoQ10, then the electron transport chain also gets diminished in function and you can't make enough ATP. So hopefully you see how important the mitochondria is. You see how important proper nutrition is. You need B vitamins, you need iron, you need CoQ10, you need magnesium, you need omega-3s, you need good fish oils for all of this stuff to work. So um, here's the nucleus. Deep to the nucleus is the nucleolus. And you can see we got a nuclear envelope and the extension of that is the endoplasmic reticulum. And when you have ribosomes attached to it, it's the rough ER. The nuclear envelope has nuclear pores and the nuclear pores, that's where your um, messenger RNA and ribosomal RNA, that's where all of that escapes. So the nucleus contains the hereditary units of the cell and that's called the genes. And the genes are arranged along chromosomes. In terms of protein synthesis, this is where the nucleus and the nucleolus and the nuclear pores come in. So here's the nucleus, that's the larger part. We have DNA, we've got nuclear pores, we have ribose nucleic acid, and you can see the RNA slips right through the nuclear pores, and it's interacting with the ribosomes. Okay. So when we talk about proteins and protein synthesis, we need transcription to take place, which occurs in the nucleus, and it's the process by which the genetic information that's encoded in the DNA is copied. It's copied in, onto a strand of RNA. And that's gonna direct protein synthesis. The translation of that, the translation, because we have two different languages. We have a nucleic acid language. We have a nucleic acid language. And we have an amino acid language. We have two different languages, so we got to translate it. So translation occurs in the nucleus, and it's the process of reading the messenger RNA nucleotide sequence to determine the amino acid sequence in the newly formed protein.
right? So that's the translation. It's translating the nucleotide language into the amino acid language. So we, the body knows what type of proteins are going to be created and it's coded and it's following the template of the DNA code. Try and keep it as simple as we can. Okay.